So ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to uh, uh, another uh, great afternoon of CLE uh, that is being sponsored by uh, Clifford Law Offices and I, I really welcome you uh, here today. I'm Bob Clifford and I'm founder and senior partner of Clifford Law Offices here in Chicago. Uh, we've got a very busy two hours ahead of us and I'll try to keep us on time. Please bear in mind that the court wants us to be pretty strict in how we manage the time of this event. Uh, so permit me in that regard to then start with introducing our panelists to you so that we can get right down to business. Uh, to my left, as uh, many of you know, uh, the Illinois Supreme Court has approved new professional responsibility CLE requirements that take effect this year. Every licensed lawyer in the state is now required to report one hour of wellness or substantive, uh, substance abuse programming, as well as one hour of diversity or inclusion programming. Uh, we are offering both of those to you here right now. Uh, a note, uh, just like last year, we will be conducting uh, polls from the audience and those viewing via our webcast. In order to participate in the polls, you must either visit our polling website, um, and it's P-O-L-L-E-V dot com backslash Clifford Law or text Clifford Law to 22333. Uh, do not click on the webcast itself. It will not link to the polls. Uh, and once again, that's uh, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com backslash Clifford Law or text Clifford Law to 22333. Um, our first uh, esteemed panel consists of four people uh, who many of you will probably recognize uh, uh, in their respective fields. Um, I, I won't go into their entire background in great detail, but all of that information uh, can be found on my firm's website, CliffordLaw.com. So our, our first uh, panel uh, entitled, uh, The Path to Lawyer Well-Being, we have the Honorable uh, Judge Kenneth Wright, who is the head of the uh, Municipal Division, First Municipal Division of the Cook County Circuit Court, and he chairs the Illinois State Bar Association Special Committee on Health and Wellness, where he also sits on the ISBA Board of Governors. Uh, Judge Wright, thank you for being here, sir. Uh, uh, next to Judge Wright, uh, uh, we, well, not next to, are you there, Robin? Here we yeah, right here, that's what I said. Uh, to my immediate left is Robin uh, uh, Bellow, and Robin is the executive director of the Lawyers Assistance Program, better known to all of us here in Illinois as LAP, uh, and she deals with, and the organization deals with uh, lawyer wellness every day. Uh, then uh, to our, next to Judge Wright, we have Tr Tracy Kepler, who is the uh, director of the American Bar Association Center for Professional Responsibility. And then uh, between, the, between uh, uh, Tracy and uh, Robin, we have Jim uh, Fought, who is the Associate Dean of Administration at Loyola University School of Law and who's served on the Chicago Bar Association's Committee on the Future of the Profession, serving as its Chair of the Law Student and Young Lawyer Subcommittee. Uh, and in the audience, uh, Karen, would you raise your hand? That's Karen Munoz over there. She's a partner at Dolan Law in Chicago, and she's a certified yoga instructor who will demonstrate some chair yoga exercises that we can all do in our offices when we leave uh, and, and have a couple of minutes. Fair warning, here's the tort warning. Clifford Law denies any and all responsibility to anyone for doing these things. You do them at your own risk, or don't do them at all, okay? Now our second panel today, uh, which is entitled Conscious Inclusion, and that will deal with implicit bias and diversity in the legal workplace. Uh, our esteemed speakers on this panel include, and they're in the front row there right next to Bill, uh, we have uh, Judge uh, uh, Tom Donnelly uh, from the Law Division of the Circuit Court of Cook County, who chairs the Illinois Judicial College Board of Trustees, which is the Illinois Supreme Court's educational arm, uh, thank you, Judge Donnelly, for being here. We have Kunyan Gordon, Senior Counsel and Director of the Settlement Assistance Program, which is a Chicago organization committed to securing racial equality and economic opportunity 
from the grassroots level. She also is a former civil litiga litigator at Jenner and Block, uh, where she learned the, the distinction between uh, and earned the distinction of being the first African American woman to make partner at that firm, uh, following in the steps of uh, great Joan Hall, uh, also a, a wonderful partner at uh, Jenner. Uh, then we have uh, Josie uh, Goff from Loyola University School of Law, who's the Assistant Dean for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity. And then finally on that panel, we have Allison Wood. Uh, Allison, who's a former ARDC Hearing Board Chair and Litigation Counsel. Um, and she is now Principal of Legal Ethics uh, Consulting in Chicago uh, uh, and advises lawyers and law firms on the very topics that we'll be discussing today. So uh, for the next two hours, our esteemed panels will take you through hypotheticals, analysis, and study that will provide you with practical advice about how to better handle the issues of wellness and balance in our lives, as well as diversity and implicit bias that lawyers must learn to recognize in the profession and in our workplaces. Uh, we have, uh, uh, interestingly, as I mentioned to the group uh, uh, before we went online, uh, at the first time we did this, we had a total of 700 people uh, uh, in attendance and online, and today we are uh, well over 5,100 people. So. Thanks to all of you for uh, doing that and for participating, and, and I hope that's a, a statement of support in, in what we're doing and the quality we'll, we're doing it, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, so we have lawyers from all over the state and some throughout the country who are registered for this program. Um, it's the largest in the country doing this kind of uh, uh, instruction, and we encourage all of you online and those of you here to ask questions of our panelists when the opportunity presents itself. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can in the next two hours. And uh, those of you here can just raise your hands, and we have a roving microphone that will be brought to you uh, with any pertinent questions on these important subjects. Uh, I think Ashley is here. Ashley started working for me when she was 15. We didn't have a permit, sorry. She's 24 now. Uh, she still works for us. Uh, she's, she's great, and uh, we're proud to have her here. Uh, so to learn more about these topics, uh, please explore the various materials and handouts that you've received either electronically or here in the room. Uh, this seminar is being taped and the two-hour program and the materials will be available for viewing later, but not for CLA credit. So you can log into uh, the program on our firm's website, clifford.law.com, but you will not get uh, credit uh, other than for your attendance live today. Um, so, folks, I'm, I am committed to raising the quality of the practice uh, uh, of law and in, in, in just in general and in our state, as well as promoting civility and goodwill among lawyers. And, and I hope this timely program is yet another step in that direction. I, I can't tell you the number of lawyers who have come to me in advance of today who have said, I'm really looking forward uh, to hearing from your panelists today, especially uh, with, the, with the wellness component. Uh, I'm, I'm 55 years old and I'm burned out every day. I get home at 7 o'clock, I spend some time with my children, um, and I have to turn to two hours of emails uh, uh, because I have clients who are demanding and they want answers now real time. Uh, the, the free air has is, is gone out of the balloon. How do I handle that? Because if I don't find a way to handle it, uh, I'm not going to be able to keep those clients. And those are the kind of questions that I hope we, we will address today through the comments of our uh, panelists and, and also from some of the hypotheticals. So, uh, so let me begin with one hypothetical, the first, our first today. So uh, here's the hypo. Uh, I have an attorney in my office uh, who is often late, smells of alcohol, has bloodshot eyes, often is disheveled, and sometimes slurs her words after lunch. I am also getting calls from her clients that she is missing court dates, and there are all kinds of typos in the pleadings she is filing. Uh, question, should I confront the attorney privately about a possible problem? Should I tell her if you don't do something about it, I will? Uh, do I need to inform my managing partner about the attorney's possible problem? Uh, Robin, now let me start with you. You're right here. What do you think? Absolutely. I would speak to the attorney, maybe not use the word confront. Um, one of the things that you would want to look for um, when sitting down with the lawyer is if you follow on the second page it's the map 
So the mood or attitudinal disturbances, appearance or physical changes, productivity and quality of work. So these are all changes that you see in a person. Um, one of the things we say, you know, if someone has never been a snappy dresser and they continue to not be a snappy dresser, that's not a change. Um, but again, if you see something different, when you sit down with the person, that's what you want to talk about. Um, you want to use open-ended questions. You want to be non-confrontational, but just say, I'm concerned about you. This is what I'm seeing. And you can talk about the different areas in the map. Um, be prepared. They will likely be defensive. We lawyers are very good at putting up barriers and saying no. But the thing is, is that you may have planted and likely have planted a seed with them. They now know that they're not hiding these changes from everyone. People are seeing them. And they also know that you are a safe person that they can come talk to. So they may not engage with you in that conversation. It could be an hour later. It could be a week later. It could be a month later. But you absolutely should speak with them. And you can always call the Lawyer's Assistance Program, too, even confidentially, and we will walk you through the conversation. You, you know, in that regard, t tell us just a snippet, if you would, about at LAP and, and the confidentiality that's associated with it. I mean, people are afraid of jeopardizing their careers by a breach in the confidentiality. Is there something can you, that you could tell us about that? Absolutely. It is 100% confidential. It, it, we're bound by Supreme Court Rule 1.6. And even if you call in with regards to a colleague or friend, you do not have to share your information with us. If you choose to do so, we can then not share that information with anybody else. So it is a very, very safe place to call, um, to get ideas, to talk about things, um, either for yourself or for others. So be assured. It's 100% confidential. You know, Judge Wright, uh, uh, have you seen anything, or what would you do if this situation, instead of it being a lawyer in your office, what would you do if you saw it uh, uh, in the form of a lawyer who, uh, on a regular basis, appears in front of you? And, and uh, what, what would you do about that? Well, I would confront the lawyer about it first. But I also would ask the lawyer to have uh, moving the lab. Call up about that. Judge, and my can reason for. Thank you. I can't look this way now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I would make sure that the person, the lawyer, I would speak with the lawyer myself about the particular problem, but I also ask the lab to have a meeting with this person. And because I don't know how long it's been happening, I would want the managing partner as well to know about this if it came to me that the person was more than one time doing this. Now, at the point we are now, we're just assuming the, the uh, scenario is what it is, I would just talk to the lawyer and then ask the lab to get involved. And because lab is confidential, it wouldn't hurt that person any. I would expect that person to deny that this is happening first. So that's why I'd want, and they have resources that they could help this lawyer with. Let me ask you this, Robin. What about the fact that, okay, I'll put this out there. This is, it's, it's a woman, the hypo, it's a woman. Uh, I'm a male. I'm the managing partner. I bring her in. Uh, she's going to be defensive. We all know that, right? We've, you've seen it. Uh, do I have that meeting alone, or do I, I call uh, our, uh, somebody to be with me? Do I reach her confidentiality by immediately reaching out the lap and having you guys help me or conduct a meeting with me? What's your advice on that? So I would definitely recommend having someone else in the room with you, and we would do that even if it was a man, you know, speaking with a man. Uh, we always suggest having um, a trusted colleague. You know, if, there's, if it is a firm, uh, figure out who that person um, relates to best, you know, a trusted colleague, so it's a friendly face, especially if it's the managing partner um, is going to be talked to that person. And you wouldn't necessarily have breached the person's confidentiality because you don't even need to tell us that person's name in order to get assistance from the lawyer's um, assistance program about what to say and how to have the conversation. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at, yes, sir. Because this is a woman, I would not want to speak with this person all by myself. I want to find out from other judges if they've experienced any problems with this particular lawyer. If they say yes, they've experienced this problem, then I'd want some other lawyer, and preferably a female, to be with me when I spoke uh, to the lawyer. Right. Interestingly, on our poll, uh, a small percentage, 10 under 15 percent, uh, think that the answer to the confronting the lawyer privately about the problem is, is yes, and the uh, resounding is no. Uh, and then, though, it's 
is I've had a flop here. Uh, uh, should I tell her if you don't do something about it, I will? Or that's a resounding yes, but I guess you can't do that unless you talk to her. Uh, <laughs> bad Bob. All right. Okay. Uh, but I think maybe the answer would be different if uh, if we if we said the hypo in the beginning. You're doing it with someone else. Uh, and do you need to inform your managing partner about the lawyer's possible problem? You know, speaking on behalf of myself as a guy who runs a law firm, I think I'd want to know because, imp I mean, think about the fiduciary duties we have to our clients. How do we know that she's not messing up a case or blowing a statute or, I mean, those are some of the real, real life problems we have, right, Miles? Miles Beerman, leading family law lawyer in America and Chicago. Thanks for being here again. You have this. Tell us about that. Wait, wait one second, Miles. Ashley's racing to get you. Uh, if, if you have somebody in your office, a fellow lawyer in your office, you've got to confront the problem, and, you've, and I fully agree with the panel that you need two people in the room, and you've got to, you're doing it for not only the benefit of your firm, but you're doing it for the benefit of the lawyer. Uh, you know, the lawyer's going to hurt herself or himself in, in, in their career if they don't get straightened out right away. Okay. Some of these problems aren't solvable, okay. and something, you know, bad could happen, but um, you, you must confront the problem, All right. All right. Thank and you. Uh, you must do it with two people in the room. Thanks, Miles. Bob, we have a question from our thousands who are on and joining us here, and it's uh, for Robin, really. Does your program also extend to law students and paralegals of the services that you offer? We assist lawyers, judges, and law students. We unfortunately um, don't assist paralegals. However, if let's say Bob called me up and said, I'm concerned about a paralegal in the office, we would absolutely coach you through what to say um, and give you some ideas for referrals. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay. And Bob, if I just may add to yes, your sorry. point yes. and to the other points, a lot of firms nationally are creating um, best practice guidelines and model impairment policies for the law firm so that they have a template and a guideline for exactly this situation. How to walk through it, HIPAA concerns, confidentiality concerns, malpractice, professional liability concerns. And so that is very helpful and instructive when dealing with these kinds of situations. Sounds like an ABA National Institute in the making. <laughs> okay, let's go to hypo number two. Uh, Angela and fellow attorney Bruce are good friends. Angela notices that Bruce has been withdrawn lately and has missed some court calls. Bruce tells Angela there is nothing wrong and he's just a bit stressed. Too many emails. Bruce has started carrying around a mint tin. After a few mints, Bruce becomes agitated and then after some time seems to crash. Angela is concerned that Bruce is concealing a substance abuse problem. Question, should she report him to the ARDC? Tracy, XARDC. <laughs> yes, exactly. As the as the resident um, XARDC regulator, disciplinary person, along with Allison Wood, um, I have to call out the elephant in the room. I mean, what they're really asking is, do you have a Himmel obligation to report this person? And I think when you look at that rule and you look at the subtext of what you have to report under 8.4 B and C or 8.3 B and C, it's really only criminal conduct as well as conduct that involves fraud, dishonesty, deceit, or misrepresentation. Luckily, also within that rule in subsection C, they talk about confidentiality in, as part of the lab process, as something that is not supposed to be reported. And so I think it's important to get that off the table and talk about what you should do. If I'm not supposed to report and I don't have an obligation to, is there something I can do? Is there something where this situation, I can contact the lab? And I think Robin has talked about when you can do that and why you should do that. Another thing I think Robin is going to talk about is some of the data that we have seen of late um, from a 2016 ABA Betty Ford Hazelden study regarding what we're seeing in the practice, what we're seeing in the profession with regard to substance abuse disorders, as well as various mental health concerns. Okay. And uh, Robin, and every before you answer, uh, no, looking at our poll, uh, when we look at the proposed actions that could be taken, the strongest action is to not report to the ARDC, and the better course would be for Angela to call the lab program uh, and request an intervention. Do, uh, uh, are there, do you have interventions? Uh, 
We do. So tell us about that. So the soft intervention is what I already discussed, where we would coach you through uh, with you know with a partner that you would speak to the person. If that doesn't work, we would consider doing a formal intervention, which is very much like what you see on TV. We would gather together family, friends, and colleagues. Um, in a very compassionate, loving manner, not confrontational, um, and to talk about the person's issue. And then LAP, um, it's team led by a judge and a LAP volunteer, and there's clinical staff obviously that walks, walks the group through it, um, but it's been very successful to get people to, into treatment and to get the assistance that they need. Okay. We have a question here from Paul on, uh, on the internet, and if there's been intervention with LAP, uh, with subsequent tre treatment, but problems still exist, then what do you do? Sorry, Pam, can you repeat that? Yes, if there has been treatment for a problem involving, and LAP has been involved, and then after the treatment, there's, the problem still exists, what is the law firm lawyer to do? It unfortunately is not unusual. Sometimes treatment doesn't stick or work the first time. Um, as you may know, you know, mental health and addiction, there is no cure. And so ongoing treatment is often recommended. One of the things that we offer at the Lawyer's Assistance Program is case management. So as that person is leaving treatment and we will help step them down into lower levels of care, but we will follow them for as long as they want to be followed and assist them with that. Um, but there are many services that can be put into place to help that lawyer uh, get back on the path to recovery and wellness. You know, in our materials, uh, we've included a, a link to the 2016 ABA study, the ABA uh, Hazelden study that uh, Rob and Betty Ford Foundation study uh, that Robin mentioned that shows that one in three practicing lawyers are problem drinkers uh, based on the volume and the frequency of alcohol consumed. 28% suffer from depression and 19% show symptoms of anxiety, uh, uh, which is pretty remarkable to me and and uh, but I suppose to all of us uh, that study tell you know Robin we could probably do this whole program with you I mean tell, <laughs> tell us more about what what uh, lap is doing uh, to help the bar address these issues 28 percent depression rate 19 percent severe anxiety 11.5 uh, percent suicidal thoughts uh, during their career uh, with the higher levels for male of depression than females uh, and the rates uh, uh, decrease as age increases. So these are junior, you know, this problems in many ways. So one of the things that we've done is really to try and get into the law schools and to get them the assistance that they need uh, before this problem starts to mushroom. Unfortunately, with the Hazelden Betty Ford study, one of the things that came out of it was age is a predictor of impairment. And typically, you would think of Bob's um, comment earlier about, you know, 50 and older, getting burned out, you can see retirement, but it's not quite there yet. And you're like, how can I do this for another 10 or 15 years? It has actually flipped. The biggest indicator of impairment is age, and it's under the age of 30. And so we are trying to direct a lot of our resources into the law schools. One of the programs that we now offer are LAP office hours, where we go sit at the law schools once a month for four hour stints, and people can either drop in or they can make appointments. One of the most telling things um, from a student said to me, I would not have called you but for the fact that you were here. And so they stopped in for assistance. So the law schools is where we're really trying to make um, an impact right now. There's also a question here that says, what about it when you have a two-person law firm and you want to confront the person? <laughs> How do you handle that? Anybody? Well, that has happened before, and you know, many, many solo practitioners, obviously, because of the isolation due to practicing as a solo, um, have issues of anxiety, stress, and depression. When the person referring the, the person with the impairment calls in, we will ask them, are there any other friends or colleagues, uh, maybe a judge that they're close to that we can include in on this conversation? Um, so we, we try and get creative with what we can do. And in addition to that, I mean, I think as those of you who know me know that I'm a big advocate for participation and membership in the organized bar, whether it's uh, the CBA, the ISBA, or the ABA, um, I, I think that our you know, involvement in, in the bar uh, associations makes, makes you a better lawyer, but also one of the things that uh, becomes available to you are, are the resources that you're hearing a bit about today, whether it's networking with LAP or, 
Uh, you know, uh, the ISBA has an incredible amount of its resources that it, uh, it you know, advocates and makes available to, to Illinois lawyers. So to that two-person law, law firm, you know, if you join the ISBA, you're more than a two-person law firm. Uh, and and, and I, it's not patronizing when they say they, they take their charter seriously to, uh, you know, help the mem their members. And the ABA does the same. You know, I don't want to go, get off on the bar associations, but the membership is dropping like a brick and water because we older folks are not doing our part, I think, to tell people the value that, uh, tell the young lawyers the value that they get out of uh, their, their membership. Uh, one more thing sure, with regard to the question about the two-person firm. Um, yes, of course you can contact LAP, but I also think there's value in talking to that person yourself. Um, recognizing that it's not going to be an easy conversation. You're not going to say, you know, I'd like to talk to you because I care, and they're going to say, yes, I have a problem, let's go to LAP. I mean, it's an ongoing discussion that you're going to have. Also recognizing that we as lawyers um, kind of are the master of spin. I mean, we know how to get out of answering a direct question, and we're never going to say, oh, yes, as a matter of fact, I do have a problem, let's get it fixed, or let's, let's talk about it. Yeah, Jim? Yeah. Judge, uh, first Jim, then Judge. Um, as, a, as a person who works with law students uh, on a regular basis and as a uh, member of the board at LAP for the last 30 years, I. I really need to add that uh, one of the things we've learned is that LAP alone cannot uh, change our legal culture. I think that's one of the things you were saying, Bob. Uh, we can't just assume that the lawyer's assistant program will satisfy uh, the legal profession's uh, responsibilities regarding lawyer well-being. Uh, all corners of the legal profession need to prioritize this, and I think that's really one of the uh, great benefits of a program like this today. We, we all share this responsibility, um, and uh, it, 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 we can't leave it to, to just a lap uh, to, to solve these problems. Okay. Well, thank you. Can I have a question that you're, that are you really saying that 28 percent of all lawyers are depressed? Is that what the statistic means? Yes. And there's also a question, how do these statistics stack up against other professions of depression, alcoholism, and other issues? Well, I, first of all, I can say this, the Betty, Betty Ford ABA Hazelton study was a study of 15,000 lawyers across the country, all, um, um, you know, diversity, geographical diversity, age, where you practice. Um, and so it was a study of 15,000 and of self-reporting. And so that's where that data comes from. Um, and as for other professions, lawyers with regard to um, substance use and problematic drinking, are much higher. You saw the statistics where we compared in the graph with just the general public, with um, young, with all attorneys, and then with attorneys under 30. But when you look at the demographics and the studies for pilots, for accountants, for the medical profession, who seems to be much further ahead on well-being issues than the legal profession, their incidences are lawyer, are lower. Okay. Judge, you wanted to add something? Yes, I wanted to say that very often lawyers will come into an organization like a uh, firm or even law clerks early in life, and find that it's a fast moving pace, lot to do, can't really keep up and can't do it. And nobody's saying to them, maybe you ought to try something else, because we're afraid, we think we, our job is to make sure they become lawyers, and they become good lawyers, and they don't have the stamina to do that. Interesting stuff. Okay, next, moving along, next hypothetical, number three. An associate was hired for her hardworking attitude and excellent results. Uh, lately, though, her supervising attorney uh, has been heavily redlining her briefs. The associate's door is closed all the time now. She is at work regularly, but she has been skipping associate lunches and mixers. Uh, the supervising attorney points uh, out uh, these issues, and, and to uh, his surprise, she is very apologetic. In fact, she says, um, I'm sorry, I don't deserve to be here. I don't uh, deserve the opportunities you are giving me. I will work harder. So question, should the supervising attorney get involved? Is it appropriate for the supervising attorney to ask the associate whether uh, she is depressed, has had uh, thoughts about killing herself, has done anything to prepare for uh, the end of life? Who wrote this one? Did you write this one? <laughs> God. Maybe yes. Is this, actually. Is this based on a is this based on a case? All right. A panel worked on this, Bob. I, I didn't do I, this myself. I know that. <laughs> I do. I've looked at you because I figured I'd get a little laugh. I didn't want to look at them. 
All right, here we go. First off, should the supervising attorney get involved? Jim, what do you think? I think the answer is yes. Okay. I, you know, I think... Um, so does the fan. The polls agree. Good. All right, and, resoundingly. Okay. Well, we even have questions on it all. Well, we're not there yet. We're, right. we're still working on our answers. So is, my question. So is it appropriate for the supervising attorney to ask the associate whether she's depressed? Jim? Again, I, I, don't, I, I don't see great risk. And I, again, uh, those of us who have gone through the lab uh, training yes. uh, do not see a great risk in asking these difficult questions because, uh, number one, I think they're often perceived as caring gestures. And uh, they, they also uh, tend to lead uh, to, to more open discussion, more open conversation about these issues rather than to trigger the, you know, the, the, the suicide impulse. I think there's well, less risk. And, and that's why, how about digging deeper and asking about the suicide impulse? Should the uh, supervising attorney do that, go so far as to do that? I would say yes. Wow. Um, and, and is there, uh, in going so far as to ask about have you done anything to kind of take any preparation for this? I, I think that's entirely appropriate if they feel that uh, the circumstances as described here uh, warrant it. I, I do not think that's an inappropriate Robin, place say? to go. Um, absolutely. On all the same, you agree with Jim? I all? do. Always, I always agree with my board member, Jim Flott. So. Yeah. <laughs> what? Well, there's what, also do, an what, what do you here? not do? Let's talk about what you don't do. So you don't want to discount their problems. If someone um, comes in and says to you, you know, my wife just filed for divorce, and then they start going down this road where you're getting very concerned, they're obviously depressed, and you're thinking, wow, this might be, this person might be suicidal, and you ask them questions about that, don't say to them, you know, people get divorced every day. It's really not that big a deal. We'll get through it. You'll find another one. Yeah. <laughs> not good to say. Because in that moment, that problem, whatever it might be, is insurmountable for them. So you have to meet them in that space. You have to say to them, you know, I understand, you know, I'm hearing you, this is terrible, you know, this is tragic, you know, I'm gonna get right in there with you, I'm gonna help you through this together. Oh, oh, but you Robin, do want to please don't tell anyone, please don't tell anyone. I beg you not to tell anyone about our conversation. What do you say about that? About that? So I did lie about lap confidentiality. Um, if someone is suicidal, that's when secrecy goes out the window for anyone, including okay. a friend or a colleague, because most likely they will ask you um, to keep it secret. And you just be upfront with them and say, absolutely not. You're too important to me. This relationship means too much to me. We're going to go get help together. And that's one of those things where you can call 911 together. You can call app together. You should not leave them alone. Um, you should go get someone to sit with them while you figure out what next to do. Uh, Tracy, anything to add to that? You know, I always, my husband always tells me, you know, JD doesn't mean MD. You know, you don't have to diagnose these people. You're not the one who's coming up with the terms, are you, are you, you know, suffering from depression? Are you doing, you know, you're just from a place of, I care. I'm interested. Something seems not right. Let's talk about it. Uh, uh, yes, Ron. That's, that's my approach. See, I don't think that we ought to be asking those specific, specific questions. I think they ought to be supervised an attorney or to be talking to the person. I think the person should be doing the same thing, talking to the person. Let's, there's a problem here. Let's, what about it? Let's, let's well, talk. My Let's concern is, on a, on a very serious note, I'm, well, I'm not a professional. I don't know this stuff. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I'd be stupid enough to say, oh, don't worry. You know, somebody else will come your way. I mean, you, know, you, can't, do, you can't do that. Uh, I mean, that's harmful. That's potentially harmful. So, we're, so, so how about is, is, does LAP teach supervising lawyers how to, how to maybe manage this stuff or other classes? Or? Absolutely. So we give tons and tons of CLE presentations. Um, one of the most popular ones is called Recognizing, Understanding, and Referring a Colleague in Need. And su uh, suicide, unfortunately, is one of the topics that we have to cover. One of the things I do want to point out is that it's absolutely okay to say the word suicide to someone that you are concerned about. Um, saying the word is not going to trigger them. It actually makes it more real from them. And, and at that point, they may take a step back and you know they're like, holy cow, am I really thinking about suicide? So it's okay to say the word. It's okay to put it out there front and center. All right, well, thank you. And questions from the audience, Bob, here. Is it possible that people are depressed without knowing it simply because they've been that way their whole lives? How do you know you're depressed or expect others to recognize it if that's the way you are? And the second thing is, is that do you think that lawyers are hesitant to report issues of anxiety or depression, even suicide, because of the stigma involved 
regarding the potential to lose your license, lose your job, or just uh, social concerns that lawyers have. Please enter the following MCLE verification code, 1360 always wins out uh, but stigma is you know the second reason why lawyers will not ask for help with regards to substance abuse or mental health issues okay you know I, so here's a uh, unsolicited commercial announcement so I have there's a lawyer friend uh, Alan Alonji and well-known practitioner locally does the state work but finding ways to, to, to ease the stress of our work and his mind He's turned to kind of poetry, and, and, he, and he writes, and he, he thinks good thoughts and positive thoughts. He's written these books, uh, I Was Once Walking and Saw This, and the other one, uh, Drawn to World Order. They're available on Amazon.com. Uh, and, you know, just encouraging people to find alternative ways to spend their time and uh, that's positive and peaceful to them when you have too many emails uh, that go your way, Leslie. Okay, next one. Hypo for what? Okay, is there also a specific well, is this a question? Question, yes. Okay. Are there specific areas of practice, though, that seem to have a greater rate of depression uh, that are tied to them? Have, has the panel noticed that? So we don't necessarily keep the statistics with regards to that, but just being a clinician and meeting with people, um, definitely family law is one. Um, criminal. You know, if you're a state's attorney or public defender, you really see the worst in people. Um, there's a lot of compassion fatigue that is associated with those areas. Um, but it's in many, many different, it's, it's everywhere. It's very prevalent throughout the legal profession because we are in a helping profession. And when your clients show up at your door, they're not in a happy state. They have a problem that needs to be solved. So it could be a contract dispute. It could be bankruptcy. How about those of us who have to put up with insurance defense lawyers? Absolutely. <laughs> Dealing with insurance companies has got to be the worst. So it's what everywhere. Only kidding. All my friends from Allstate, only kidding. When, yes, accepting them. When, when does a firm, though, take a position that the attorney must be terminated and that either you do, they can't, the person cannot be helped, that the firm cannot deal with the problem or their, uh, the lack of production or the risk involved? Oh, that's a tough one. Because how about ADA on that one? Mm -hmm. uh, I Anybody mean, these on are the tough panel? situations. If, if, you know, frankly, I think if I, had this, if I had this problem in the office, in addition to calling lab, I'd probably call my, ins my health insurer, my broker, and say, what kind of services are available for my employee? Uh, uh, do you deal with that, uh, uh, Robert, or Tracy? Do you see that, uh, where the insurance companies actually step up and proactively, does it matter what your policy provides, or are the insurers out there doing that, the health care providers? The policies are very troubling because uh, even though there's supposed to be parity, um, the services that are offered for mental health and substance abuse often pale in comparison to what you would experience if you had diabetes or cancer. Yeah. Um, so it is very difficult. We do encourage firms, let's say you called me with regards to one of your lawyers working for you, um, to work with them and try and get them the assistance that they need. But sometimes a firm just has to let someone go um, because it has gone too far. But we've, we've seen everything. Yeah. I'll add with regard to the, you know, the CNAs, the Alas, the Alps, the Aons, the Nabrico carriers, all of those risk management carriers are, have been part and have, been, have had buy-in and are stakeholders to this national conversation that's going on. And so they're really looking at well-being tied to competence, tied to malpractice claims, tied to risk um, in the firms, and are looking at how to combat that from their perspective, not as a reactive mechanism, but as a proactive mechanism. Thank you. Okay, hypo number four. Oh, Judge Wright, you're going to like this one. All right, the judge never takes a vacation. He takes his job very seriously. He gets to the courthouse early and stays late each day. He ignores his increasing fatigue. By the time he leaves for the day, he has just enough energy to go to the drive through for dinner and then to go home and sleep. The judge is undoubtedly becoming short-tempered in the courtroom. The lawyers in the courthouse are concerned about the judge's temperament. Should one of the, or more of them uh, speak up? Should they talk to the supervising judge about the issue? Should they contact the chief judge's executive committee? Should they contact the Judicial Inquiry Board, JIB? Should they ask for a change of judge? Should they do nothing and wait for the Bar Association to review the judge's temperament when, it, when up for retention and find them unqualified? Wow, judge. First, they should talk to the supervising judge first. 
I, if they if they want to go talk to the since there's several of them, both sides, opposing sides as well, think the judge is having these problems, they can go and talk to them if they want to. But I would suggest going straight to the supervising judge. I would also involve that with this as well. Uh, I don't see the, what harm could be done, and maybe some help could be with an intervention there as well. Right. Um, if you excuse yourself, you still left the problem there. So I think the, you can rec the judge could you could, rec you could change judges, but you still need to have right. this judge. Yeah, Ninety-one percent of our poll think you should talk to the supervising judge about the issue. Uh, uh, Robin, what do you think? I would absolutely recommend that as well. Not asking for a change of judge. That, you know, the problem with that is that you might be, you're using a, you know, you're using a an SOJ, but you only get one, right? And uh, now you're using now your clients adversely impacted by that because you're, if you're going to change judge, you want to do it for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. Uh, so, uh, or should you just do nothing and let, walk away from it? How proactive do we need to be nowadays as lawyers, Jim? Again, I, 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 uh, it's a complicated question, Bob. I mean, I think we have to know what our uh, risks are for our client when we do things like that, and I, it's a calculation that I think, yeah, you're right, it's a complicated one. It, it depends, in my mind, on a case-by-case -case evaluation. Yeah, I think Judge Wright's answer and Robin's answer is the, the right one because it strikes me that, like, if you went to the judge and you kind of said, you know, I could see the judge interpreting this, uh, you know, these lawyers are just saying that about me. They just want me to get off of the case or, you know, it could really prejudice your client. Uh, so you don't want that. But at least maybe the, the chief judge, you could do it uh, with a measure of, of uh, anonymity uh, and confidentiality, right? Uh, although I do know of an instance, I hate to tell you this, about 15 years ago when some of us went to a supervising judge about a judge for these very reasons and that supervising judge wouldn't take the meeting, didn't oh. want to hear about it. But if you send him to our chief judge and executive committee, right. you're going to have some problems thereafter. It won't just be a confidential thing. All of us presiding judges in the committee, right. and there's 16 of us would, would know what your problem is. Right. No, I, yeah, I, but I, you'd I, also know the lawyers who came to you, though. Well, the lawyers need to have some assurance that they're not going to be adversely impacted. That's supposed to be. Right. Judge, there's a question here, though, that if you do talk to the supervisory judge, wouldn't you then need to SOJ because you have a potential risk for your client? Yeah, well, those that issues that would, are there. Yeah, that would be something that the lawyers would have to decide for themselves um, as to whether or not they want to use the SOJ that way. And one side may want to, another would not, may not. Well, that's the one nice thing about, I think, if you look at the circuit court system in Illinois, generally, you know, we practice obviously a lot here, but also in DuPage. Uh, and, and will and the and the and it's, the bars are small, and I think people are really interested in uh, one another's well-being. And maybe I'm a little naive about that, but I, I, I think that's true, especially when you talk to the members of the executive committee who run the divisions. You know, so there's there's a positive atmosphere that's receptive to this kind of uh, reporting. Well, there's Could a question about going with other. Excuse Go ahead, me. Robin. Could also contact LAP. Um, and what we would do is we would either contact the supervising judge of that division and obviously not disclose to them who the lawyer was, or more likely we would reach out and have one of our lap volunteer judges contact the supervising judge. So judge to judge, it's a much easier, better conversation. And, and I think one of the worst things that you can do is the last answer, is do nothing and wait for the system to sort itself out. Um, you know, one of the articles that I think Jim is going to talk about is about the law students, and it's titled Suffering in Silence. People are afraid to talk about this issue for the stigma, for the lack of confidentiality, for their fear they're not going to pass character and fitness. But if you're just approaching and talking about the issue from a place of caring and concern, you can have start to have the discussion versus just the withdrawal and to who knows to what end. Okay. All right. Well, uh you have well, one yeah, last question? Quick question, me? because I think we need to move on. But what a uh, question is, is uh, what about the idea or the notion of going to the judge with more than one person, not just the attorney himself, to go with a group of attorneys or other people? Well, that would certainly, there's strength in numbers. And well, very often I get uh, written complaints about a judge. Uh, one of my complaints, and I, I will speak to the judge uh, first about it without saying who has said what. Uh, unless the lawyer says, I don't mind, tell him. Usually they don't want to say that, 
they want to get their work done, so they don't want me to tell uh, that they said it. But I have to address the problem. Okay. All right, article number five. Uh, the judge has, we're ta see, this, I kind of like this. We're, going, we're talking about judges today. It's not always just about the lawyers. All right, so the judge has not been sleeping well. Uh, tomorrow she has to rule on a motion that may make new law. Uh, she is prepared but stresses out about her decision. On the day of the hearing, she does her best to maintain a clean record. The lawyers make their arguments but then begin to address each other, talk over each other, and raise their voices. That never happens. Uh, judges lose her, the judge loses her temper uncharacteristically, and she blurts out, you all are a bunch of babies, and I have had it. Uh, she then makes her ruling. Lawyers in the courtroom have noticed that uh, this has occurred more than once in recent times. So the lawyers in the case before her are trying to decide how to proceed. Should they talk to the judge herself in chambers about her concerns? Should they speak to the supervising judge? Should, should they call the JIB, call LAP? Uh, Judge Wright, uh, no, Judge, let's go to Tracy. Tracy, what do you think about this? Um, I, uh, the first one, I might be a little afraid to talk to the judge myself, but I certainly think speaking to the supervisory judge about the issue or calling LAP would be appropriate. Um, you know, I think in this instance, one of the things that we're really talking about or we could be talking about is what we were talking about at the very beginning, this concept of burnout. People just being overworked, tired, emotionally and physically worn out and not having the resilience to come back or bounce back. And part of it is recognizing the signs in yourself and also recognizing that our culture saying, you know, I haven't taken a vacation in 10 years or I stayed at the office until three and I was back at six. Well, that is. That's not cool. That's not good for our well-being, and it's not good for your health. And so recognizing you know, some of the triggers that lead to burnout or what you're doing, exhaustion, not being able to focus, feeling fuzzy, emotional detachment, and then recognizing what some of your triggers are and how to get past it. And also recognizing that, what do they say? Um, perfection, perfection is the enemy of good enough. Yeah. You know, All these kinds of things that you can do to kind of minimize the place where you find yourself, where you're having these kinds of outbursts. That's not to say that some people aren't just, you know, said, snappy dressers. Don't you know? It, it's a change that you're looking for. Yeah, some right. people are just naturally irritable. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do? Judge Wright, right, what do you think? But if those things happen, occur time after time, there's something different about it. Yeah. But also, one side is not going to be uh, um, affected by the, the ruling, whatever it is. Somebody's won that, yeah. and they're not going to hey, go with you. You know, context, yeah, but context matters, because I, frankly, when I read this initially the other day, I, I, what jumped out at me was that the lawyers started getting snarly with each other, and frankly, when that happens, I don't have a problem with the judge kind of drawing them down and calling them a bunch of babies. And, uh, you know, they deserved it. Uh, you know. That's a, that's a civility of the bar issue to me. Yeah, but, but this has been occurring. This is not yeah. something that happened right. one time or two, two times. Well, there but I just, also agree with Tracy in reference to uh, not being involved. Well, there were just some the judges who were just downright mean in general. And it's, not, <laughs> it's not like they didn't sleep well the night before. There's, there's they, had no a, change there. they slept like a baby. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. We don't right. have any of those in Illinois. No, we don't have any of those in Illinois. Okay. Huh? All right. Now we're going to have helpful... Well, here, so I guess I have to announce these, but it's in the program. Uh, helpful mediation apps, you know, meditation, meditation apps. All right, the, the, the mediation, blah. All right, the, the, the mindfulness app. Uh, there's a Calm, there's a Budnafi, there's Smiling Mind, Sattva Meditations and Mantras, uh, Breathy, Omvab, Headspace, Mind Body, Inside Timer, Meditation Timer Pro, 10% happier, Simply Be. And I got a couple guys in my office with ADD. I think I should give these to them. They should, God, okay. There's well, just something to be said for the cognitive pause, taking a moment and time and space to reflect and then going back to it. All right, very good. Okay, hypothetical number six. Um, and I am running behind here, Pam. All right, the judge is in the middle of a big trial. He is inviting to a party where he knows uh, the lawyers from one side will be in attendance. Though the judge is very ethical, he agrees to attend the party. The alcohol is served at the party, and the judge decides they have only a few drinks. One of the lawyers at the party begins to talk about the case while in the judge's presence. The judge does not immediately walk away. 
when the trial reconvenes the next day, should the lawyer at the party uh, uh, ask the judge if he heard anything and will it impact the rulings? Tell the opposing counsel the incident and together decide what to do. Wait for the judge to speak up uh, or recuse uh, himself from the case. Uh, judge Wright, what do you think about that? I think the, the judge should, now whether he will or not, she will or not, I think the judge should recuse, should um, speak up and say that I was at a party and I heard certain things and if you want me to continue this, I will. However, I still think the judge should recuse himself okay. from that matter. Robin? Interesting about this hypo, I don't think the fact that alcohol was served at the party matters at all. I think this is more of a judicial ethics issue. Right. Okay. Uh, notice that our group thinks that the, uh, tell the opposing counsel the incident and together decide what to do. That's the majority rule uh, on that one. Any questions from the audience? Well, or a from comment the, uh, from, the, uh, from the audience here of our group of thousands is another approach regarding a problem judge is available in local bar associations. Our local bar has a grievance committee. It's, of course, lawyers from across the state are answering this. The concern is brought to the committee. Then the committee approaches the judge regarding the issue. It preserves anonymity as to the source of the complaint and allows the concern to be presented to the judge. So this could be any bar association across the state of Illinois. And of course, as Bob mentioned, it's national even okay. the program. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, Leslie. If this is the middle of the trial. Right. Would a mistrial be required? Could, might be. I mean, tell me what went on. You know, how can you facts recuse matter. in the middle? Pardon? How can you recuse in the middle and just substitute somebody because, else? Because events happen. Things can occur. That's a discretionary matter for the judge to decide, right? Okay. Uh, okay, hypothetical number seven. You are the law school dean of students. Like all law schools, your school has a class attendance policy that cautions students uh, against excessive uh, absences. Uh, when a student's class absences are excessive, the faculty member may withdraw the student from the class or withhold the final examination, which will result in a failing grade. In October, a faculty member contacted you regarding Lauren a first-year law student who has missed several classes during the semester and is close to the limit of absences allowed. In addition, Lauren has not submitted the required assignments. Five weeks uh, remain in the semester. The faculty member believes that Lauren will have a difficult time passing the class and seeks your advice. You consult Lauren's other teachers and learn that she is regularly absent from those classes as well. They report that she is uh, usually unprepared for the classes Sounds like a girl who doesn't like a law school. She attends and appears to be unengaged with her classmates. Teachers press their concern that the student is likely to fail in her first semester. What would you recommend? Do, you do nothing? Advise the faculty to allow Lauren to proceed to final uh, exams? Uh, remind Lauren of the consequences of her failed failure to meet uh, minimum expectations? Give her more chance to and, and reinforce the rules? Discuss with Lauren the reasons for her absence and and miss, uh, missed assignments. Uh, so Jim, what do you think? Well, when we talk about uh, law school, I, I think most of you are, are uh, increasingly aware that in the last few years we've, we've observed a, a sea change in uh, the number of law students who have experienced mental health issues and very, uh, various other uh, impairments. And this is, of course, nothing new. It's always been there uh, in each generation. But the difference today is the sheer volume uh, more uh, and more students are better educated about their health and they seek help. And um, then there are some other issues that are causing more and more of our students to uh, suffer from mental health uh, impairments. But, uh, Tracy referred to the, the Suffering in Silence report from a couple of years ago. I hate to do statistics at you, but just let me throw these out. Over 3,500 uh, law students at 15 law schools reported one quarter at risk for alcoholism. 53% uh, got drunk within the prior 30 days as compared to 39% among graduate students. 43% went on a binge drinking uh, in the prior 30 days as compared to 36% graduate students. 17% report depression, 14% severe anxiety, 6% uh, suicidal thoughts, and then the Betty Ford Hazelton study um, lawyers 30 years old and below or 10 years out of law school had the highest rate of problem drinking in the profession. 32% uh, of them 
as compared to 21% of all attorneys and 6.4% of the, uh, of the uh, entire population. Um, it's a bigger group. And I just, as a, as a point of comparison, um, I, kept, I kept records on this over the years. Um, in 1995, we had one student in our law school who sought accommodations, and that was for a physical disability. This year, we have over 70 students, uh, and all but two have uh, mental health issues. Um, so the, that this group has grown enormously, and of course there are reasons for it, but uh, this hypothetical, a uh, little inside baseball here from law schools, this is, the, this is the canary in the coal mine hypothetical. When you, uh, when you engage a student who has been missing classes regularly and not handing in assignments, that's the first symptom of one of these problems that we have. Uh, and in it's interestingly, in the uh, hypothetical, the faculty member waited until October to start drawing attention to this. We really do t try to train the faculty to get on it quickly so that uh, when they recognize these problems, we can deal with it uh, a little earlier as it goes along. But, um, you know, um, uh, this is the type of the thing we deal with, and we recognize these early yeah. symptoms. Can you take it one step further quickly? And, and, um, and that is, okay, once you engage, then what do you do? What are you doing? Well. Um, typically, I don't, and I, I don't think this is uh, uncharacteristic of, of other law schools as well. We'll find a way to call the student in. I do a lot of this myself. Uh, confront them with the fact that uh, uh, their faculty are now aware that uh, they're missing classes, they're missing assignments, that their um, grades will suffer. And that allows you to engage in a conversation which typically opens, you hope, will open up into one in which the students will uh, tell you a little more about themselves uh, in an effort to yeah. seek accommodations in the future, which is a good thing. And that, of course, is the conclusion that our polling shows, and that is uh, take the time and discuss things with Lauren and see if uh, uh, she can be helped to make yeah. her more successful. Yeah. Uh, okay, next hypothetical. Uh, number eight, uh, you're the law school dean of students, yeah. and, and Matt is a popular a second year law student. He's uh, excellent social skills. He's not at the top of his class, but he shows a lot of potential to be a good lawyer. Uh, this week, three students in the class came to your office and asked to speak confidentially. They informed you that Matt uh, has a substance abuse problem in their mind, and they recount a, a detailed series of instances of inappropriate behavior both in and out of school. They also discussed examples of times uh, during which Matt was uh, clearly not in control of himself, and they claim that his behavior uh, has persisted since the beginning of school. The students wish to remain anonymous, and, and they want to know what you, th what you can do. And uh, either do nothing, uh, unless Matt has broken some schools, or you confront Matt with the allegations and counsel him to seek help. Uh, you meet with him and threaten to, to bring changes under the code of conduct, charges under the code of conduct, and tell him about the consequences of the abuse charged with character and fitness. Uh, Jim will take it, give you that one again. Uh, again, uh, when you receive a report like this, even anonymously, from classmates, you got to take it very seriously because faculty and administration uh, in law schools are never going to see this behavior in, inside the law schools. It's very, very rare that you see a student who is uh, uh, physically impaired because of an addiction or substance abuse. They just don't do it there. Why? Well, of course, the confidentiality. Uh, they're afraid that uh, character and fitness will, will uh, uh, hear about it and, and draw uh, judgments. And so when you get a report like that, at least in our place, we, we, um, we tend to call the student in and uh, alert that student to the, uh, to the allegations that have been made and see where the conversation goes from there. You know, there's no crystal clear way to do these things every time. Each case is a little different. But I think that the, the conversation is the important place to start with a student. Okay. Um, taking, moving on to our last typo here. Uh, Angela is our first year law student. The exam uh, finals are in a month. She comes to your office, closes the door, and breaks down in tears. She explains that she is suffering from depression uh, so, uh, since she uh, uh, was, was a child. She's now suffering from deep anxiety and depression. 
and is uh, falling behind in her classes. She can't gather the strength to catch up with her studies and is constantly fearful that she'll fail. Her parents have always supported her desire to attend law school and they have great, made great sacrifices to make that happen and pay the tuition. She does not want to disappoint them. Uh, they're not aware of how much she's suffering and she struggles to control herself, but she continues to cry as she describes her inability to meet these challenges and she sees no solutions. What, what do you do to help her? Do you advise her to withdraw from law school and return when she's over? Do you offer to allow her to drop uh, down in terms of the time of classes and give her extra time in her finals? Or do you meet with her and with her permission make contact with sources that can help her? Uh, uh, Robin, give me your take on that. I would go with option three. I don't think at this point we have enough information to talk to her about um, just withdrawing from law school and not taking final exams. Um, final exams come at students like a freight train, even though they know they're coming, it's still that one month out, we see so many students that come to our office hours with the same fact pattern scenario. Um, oftentimes, um, just having them meet with an individual counselor or perhaps joining our facilitated support group for young lawyers and law students makes a world of difference. Once they realize that they're not the only ones going through this, it's amazing the weight lifts it off their shoulders. But I would go with option three. And that uh, certainly is uh, the resounding uh, 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 encouraging I think Robin's absolutely, absolutely right on that. And the one thing I want to emphasize, because I remember the days, uh, you know, 15 years ago, when we were a little skeptical about this kind of behavior. Is, is this an attempt to manipulate the law school or the teachers or something? I, I have to emphasize that, that uh, and my wife is here to confirm this, I have these types of meetings with students two or three times a week. I get, it, 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 seriously, it's unbelievable um, to hear the, 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 the stories and the anguish that so many of our students are going through. We used to be a little skeptical about that. I need to emphasize this is real. This is, these are real things that are happening to these students, and there are reasons for them that we can't get into today, I'm sure. And the other point I want to emphasize, it's not everybody. It's, it's not, the vast majority of students are able to, to, uh, to accommodate themselves and to, and to overcome some of these things and the stress of law school they can, they can work through. But uh, it's- You make it sound like it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Well, well, we're looking at, in our case, at, at Loyola, I'm, I'm saying it's about 70 students out of our population of 700. Yeah. But let me, uh, well, let me end on that note and then say, you know, look, what's a fast forwarding, and maybe Robin can speak to this or Tracy, you know, what do you do when you take this hypo and instead of it being a law student, now it's your second year associate uh, coming to you with these same problems? Uh, what's your advice about how to deal with that? Well, the first thing I would do is to acknowledge that you hear them, you understand what they're saying, um, you can even maybe share a story of something that maybe have happened to you if you yourself had experienced the stress and anxiety because as a lawyer, I bet pretty much everybody in this room has experienced some higher level of stress and anxiety. Um, and so just kind of meet them where they're at in that moment. And you showing that you're caring and that you're willing to listen will greatly help them. And then, you know, meeting with maybe, you know, their supervisor, if you're their supervisor, taking a look at their workload to see if any accommodations can be made. Um, and then obviously referring them to outside counseling services as well. Uh, Tracy? Comments. One, there's a difference between listening to hear and listening to prepare your next question. You're listening to hear what they say. The other thing is I'm gonna say is semantics and language choices matter. They're not drunks, they're not junkies, they're not addicts, they're not crazy wackos, whatever the terms that people will use in casual parlance. Use, use substance use disorder. Use mental health issues or concerns. Talk about it like it's a fact rather than words that hurt or words that put you into a different situation. All right. Well, on that note, folks, we are done with the first portion of our panel. A great thanks, hearty thanks, Ken, Tracy, Jim, Robin. And now we're going to stretch, not fall out of our chairs. Karen Munoz is going to tell us how to do yoga in your office. We only have about a minute or two That's now. That's okay, Karen. So, You're a, thank you, panelists. Can everybody hear me? Okay. We're all going to stand up. Take a deep breath. Exhale, sigh through the mouth. 
We're going to do that two more times. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale the arms up. Press the fingertips up towards the ceiling. Exhale, slowly bring them down. Doesn't everyone feel a little bit more relaxed after sitting for an hour? Unfortunately, that's all the time I have. But <laughs> we have a one chair, real quick. Real one quick. chair exercise. All right. Can you do it real quick? Real everyone quick. Sit down now. Everyone, sit down. Yes. Hands on top of the thighs. The next panel up. Yep. Let's go. Oh. <laughs> no, you're not sitting down. Please enter the following MCLE verification code: nine two seven seven. Something you can obviously do anywhere on the train in your office. We're going to take a few shoulder rolls. Right, we carry so right. much stress in our shoulders. Doesn't matter. Still go. Still so, go. anytime the stress is coming on, draw them down the back nice and slow. You can also do simple neck rolls. Releasing tension from the neck. Real simple, you can do it anywhere, and it's very helpful. So, shoulder rolls too, right? Yep. Shoulder shoulder rolls. Thank you. Enjoy the next part of the panel. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, thank you very much. I was getting very busy. All right. Do you do that at your office? How many times a day do you do that at your office? Every day. Every day. Yeah. Wow. Do you do that? Uh, you make everybody in the firm do it? Okay. All right. Well, we're uh, at, on that, that part of our program where we're now talking about the conscious inclusion um, and diversity and inclusion is uh, in the law firm. Uh, our panelists, I previously introduced them. Uh, we're running just a few minutes behind, so uh, let me just jump right into it, if I may. Uh, take hypothetical number one. Uh, person A is a senior manager at a prominent nationwide tax consulting firm. A supervising partners propose uh, A for partnership and requested comments from the other partners on their proposal. Despite A's stellar record, some partners commented that A was aggressive and pushy and sometimes argumentative. Another partner stated that A needs a course in charm management. Will these comments help or hurt the proposal to promote A to partner? Are these fair and reasonable comments to make about a candidate? Uh, and will they help or hurt? Uh, yes or no? And, and Tom and Josie, how about Josie? Ladies first. What's your take on that? Well, first of all, when, the, when you first read this problem, we're making assumptions. We're making stereotypical assumptions that first, the senior manager is male, and the person that they're talking about is female. So I want to just put that out there for a moment. Um, in most uh, organizations, particularly in law firms, and I would assume in this firm as well, there will be or there should be an HR professional in the room so that these kinds of comments won't be made. Uh, what's important about this is uh, if you read further in the prompts and we talk about semantics and words that we use. Um, Tom might be aggressive, or he could be assertive. Um, you might think my comments today might be over the line or a little bit pushy, but my colleagues here might say, you know, she's just really persistent about her position. And certainly, um, as good lawyers, and I know we all work to be that, we sometimes do present our arguments aggressively, uh, but we're making our point. So will this hurt someone? Obviously, you know, common sense would tell you certainly it might because of the culture of most workplaces. <coughs> and believe it or not, there will be people who don't come to opportunities to engage in this kind of a conversation to know better in the room. But Tom, what do you think? Well, I, I think the supervising lawyers, if uh, your assumptions are correct, is both sexist and dumb. Um, maybe they're the same thing. Um, but 
you know, in terms of professional development, what we want to do is we want to develop each lawyer into the best lawyer they can be. And that doesn't mean duplicating the same lawyer. It means getting somebody's individual talents and making them into the best lawyer uh, they can be. And so when you're making these broad stroke categorizations about somebody or characterizations about them, you're missing the point. So I think it's, 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 it's not how good. Are you, how are you missing the point? I mean, how, how do you contrast aggressive, pushy, sometimes argumentative with demonstrates great confidence, is tenacious, is zealous? Just those are, those are words, right. descri describers. But do, would the vote count for A be different than B? Well, I, I think you're, each one describe, may describe exactly the same behavior, but just one with a positive spin and negative spin. The, the question, really, that the supervising attorney should be asking is, are they aggressive in an appropriate manner? Do, does their uh, attitude match the situation? And those are things that can't be uh, summed up in broad stroke characterizations. Uh -huh. Uh, uh, Josie, any come back to that? Well, just to, to point it out that um, in this continuum, when you start to think about stereotypical behavior or putting people into boxes, it often, and it's, and it's couched as an employment discrimination matter, it can evolve into a discrimination matter. It, and just a note here, it will 8.4. Uh, J of the rules of professional conduct make it a violation of the rules of professional conduct to discriminate uh, in an illegal way. So um, you may not only have discrimination liability, but some actionable um, disciplinary liability. Um, well, well, being you know, it's, I was in court today, and I see these lawyers, and and I could desc easily describe them as as. The one demonstrated great confidence, and he was tenacious, and he was zealous, and the, but he was also aggressive, and he wasn't letting himself be pushed around. Um, I mean, those are the, sometimes the traits of a of a strong litigator, right? Right. I mean, you see that in your work. Yeah. As, and, and so it event. depends on the context. Context matters. So that's why this these things are not very helpful in themselves. Yeah. Without further you, you explanation. Need more. Yeah. Okay. Need more. You need more. Um, but, but I think, the, the, at least to me, the takeaway is that uh, uh, when we're assessing people's strengths and making observations about them, you know, context matters, and we need to be pretty deliberate and thoughtful about how we're describing them. Would you agree with yes. that, uh, yes. uh, Josie? It's also the culture of the workplace, and it's, it's dangerous and fertile ground if you are an employment lawyer. Uh, it, well, it's a boom business, potential boom business. Okay. All right, so uh, d now the hypo number two on sentencing. Uh, defendant, an American, uh, African American, was convicted of drug uh, con uh, conspiracy and, and delivering a controlled substance, which was a class one offense. At the sentencing hearing, the defendant stated he began selling drugs in order to f feed his family, and though he put, he, he, uh, which he didn't do very well, uh, his paycheck wasn't enough. And the judge stated that there are people in our community, not African American, working and making a living to support their family while you are around waiting for someone to drop off $5 for a bag. If you think that's the only way to support your family, you are fooling yourself. The judge then sentenced him to the maximum sentence allowable for a class one felony. Were the judge's comments uh, appropriate or inappropriate? Uh, Kanyan. The judge's comments were inappropriate in that they related to race at all. Um, there are a number of factors that a judge should be considering when, when delivering a sentence, and unless something has come up that made race a factor, the fact that he mentions that there are non-African Americans who are working and making a living, um, that shows a, shows a bias that the, that the judge has. I think it's... Um, there are studies that show that, that blacks are sentenced more harshly than whites anyway for similar offenses. And it is because of that, that unconscious or maybe conscious bias. In this case, it seems like the judge's bias is pretty conscious. Um, and it's, it's, it's something called confirmation bias, where you confirm what you already believe with the information that you have in front of you. And I think this judge had in his or her mind 
that, um, that African Americans don't work as hard, that they don't try, and that they resort to criminal activity. And then the judge confirmed it with the sentence. Yeah, and, and I clearly our group agreed that it was inappropriate. Should the uh, defense lawyer, your view, have uh, brought, uh, spoken up to, uh, to, to the judge's comments and pushed back? Uh, your Honor, what do you think? Uh, yes, uh, defense lawyers should always speak up. Um, <laughs> how many would be surprised to know that the trial judge in this case was African American? That surprise you? Um, and um, the appellate court affirmed the sentence, uh, and the affirming judge who wrote the opinion was African American. He now sits on the Supreme Court. Um, but the Supreme Court, as then constituted, uh, vacated the sentence and remanded it for a resentencing. Uh, that judge said that the judge did nothing more than explain why he did not believe the defendant's excuse for selling the, the drugs was appropriate. I think it's, I think the fact that Judge Donnelly asks um, or tells us the race of the, the affirming judge and then the, the makeup of the Supreme Court uh, shows that unconscious bias can exist no matter who we are. And African Americans can have unconscious bias about African Americans the same as whites can. So um, there's no real exclusion um, based on race. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the things that are, this is obviously an explicit mention of race. Um, we're worried in this seminar about implicit bias. This is an example of perhaps explicit bias. But the question here, we were discussing this, Kenyon and I were talking about it beforehand, is any mention of a distinguishing characteristic enough to trigger reversal? Um, and I'm thinking of a couple of specific cases, uh, United States versus Miriam Santos. One issue that was raised in cross-examination was the sexual orientation of one of the witnesses. Uh, and it was raised by the defense as an issue. This was you know, brought out and it shouldn't have been brought out. And Judge Posner, in affirming, said, well, it was necessary, the, the bias, the impeaching bias, was that there was a relationship that was at issue. Um, so therefore, there was a genuine trial strategy reason uh, for this sexual orientation to be brought up during the trial. Here, what the, the, the problem I think Cunyon has with this is there's no reason for the fact that there are non-whites working in what was a surveillance video, and these folks were just caught incidentally, there's no reason for that to be brought up. So it, it becomes a little bit more problematic. Is that right? Uh, I think so. If the characteristic is an issue, factually, it has to be brought up. But if it is not, it, it certainly should never be. And can I yes. make a little advertisement for the Illinois Supreme Court? Yes, sir. Uh, so. The Illinois Supreme Court is taking very seriously the issue of implicit bias, that's as opposed to explicit bias. And implicit bias is those things which, as Cunyon points out, we may not even know about the way we make decisions. And so in 2015, the court formed the Committee on Equality to combat implicit bias. We've taken a lot of steps in terms of training judges to interrupt implicit bias. And the Supreme Court issued uh, last year a new jury instruction hot off the presses, uh, and I'd recommend you take a look at it. It's IPI Civil 1.08. That's IPI Civil 1.08. Uh, it has a wonderful comment associated, it, sort of detailing the problem with an implicit bias. And we're looking to really um, interrupt bias both on the part of judges who do a lot of fact finding uh, in this state and on the part of jurors in their fact finding. Uh, so it's something the Supreme Court takes very seriously, uh, and it's something that, as opposed to explicit bias, which is in some ways more easy to combat. So when this judge explicitly refers to something, well, it's out there on the record. More troubling is when fact finders, both judges and jurors, take these into consideration secretly, or perhaps even unknowns to themselves, their own implicit feelings about um, people of different races, orientations, socioeconomic backgrounds. And the Illinois Supreme Court is working very hard uh, to combat these kinds of biases. Great. Thank you. Um, OK, moving on. Hypo number three. Uh, uh, the dad, the father, uh, moves the court to reconsider an allocation 
of parental responsibilities judgment, claiming that the court got it wrong uh, uh, and, he, and the evidence is different. And currently there are three children involved, six, eight, and 10. They live with the dad. The mom works 60 hours a week. Uh, she's often out of town on business. Dad works from home. He does medical billing from the house. And then following a trial, which both parties testified, presented evidence, the court allocated all decision-making responsibilities and majority of parenting to the mom. The court opined during the, tr the trial that generally, quote, kids want to be with their mother, end quote. The court then chastised mom and told her to cut back on your hours at work. The lawyer for the father is kind of aghast. Well, should he or she say nothing, ask the judge to explain the evidence the court based its decision, uh, decision on, or point out the court's decision is based on implicit bias and stereotyping. Um, wow. So, Allison, what do you think about that? Highlights, um, closer, this highlights something that is a, a, a stereotype that we probably won't be able to get rid of anytime soon, right? That the, that the mother is always the best parent, that, that fathers are not nurturing or loving or attentive enough. And clearly that's not true, right? We need to be able to um, evaluate the parental abilities of each person regardless of the gender. So there's always going to be this bias, I think, and I'm sure there are people here in family law that see this a lot where judges will assume that the children want to be with the mother. And certainly standing alone, that's not really enough evidence to make that kind of decision and yet it, it happens. And, and I think one of the reasons we want this kind of question is to kind of show you that there are biases in a lot of different ways, not just race, right, but also gender and just the stereotype of the expectation. And so a judge saying, well, kids want to be with their mother, it, I don't know that there's any evidence of that, right? The problem doesn't tell us that there's evidence of that. And we would want judges, and I know the judge is going to jump in, but we would want judges to evaluate more than kids just want to be with their mother. It should certainly be a more thorough evaluation than that. Your Honor? We, one of the things we're really working with judges is to train them to do deliberative thinking rather than reflexive thinking. So reflexive thinking is automatic thinking that's often based on your implicit biases. Deliberate thinking is where you take time and really think through what are the factors you're using in making your decision. Uh, this, of course, is a potential violation of the rules of judicial conduct. Rule 63A9 uh, uh, says that a judge shall perform the judicial duties without manifesting bias against a party based on gender is one of the characteristics. And so this is actionable under the code of judicial conduct. Um, I think in this instance, um, the, the lawyer for the father should certainly say something. Uh, I like this judge only for one thing, and he seems to alienate both sides, <laughs> chastising the mom and ruling for the dad. Um, and certainly our audience uh, thinks that the judge uh, should be asked to explain uh, uh, the basis for that decision. You know, in a, in a similar uh, example, you have uh, persons A and B, and they're a same-sex couple with three children, uh, and A, with whom the children now reside, moves the court to change the allocation order claiming that B works 60 hours a week and is often out of town on business, and that A works at home, to again, remotely doing medical billing. Uh, and, and there, uh, uh, through a court-appointed representative, the children indicate they wish to be with B. Following a trial, which both parties testify and present the evidence, the court allocates all decision-making responsibilities and the majority of parenting to A over the comments, over the desire of the children. Uh, is there implicit bias there? Uh, and, and in that respect, should uh, how, how is that different than the first hypo? I mean, where, where's the implicit bias there? The kids are living with uh, A, uh, but they like B better, but the judge, looking at the evidence, decides to keep them with A. Where's their implicit bias there? Uh, uh, Allison? To the factor that it's a same-sex couple, it is really more specific to... Um, I mean, but I mean, the A and the B could have been uh, a heterosexual couple too, for, right. for purposes of what we're talking about. But what we're really seeing in this pro in this problem is the um, bias that the parent that works more hours is not capable of taking care of the children. So can I ask a silly question? So here we are. We're trying to learn from today, 
and we're talking about the two different kind of biases. I mean, what's our take? Judge, if you, in, in the ideal world, and Alice in the ideal world, what would your, your uh, takeaway be that you would want for all of us to have by the explanations you two just gave to these examples? I mean, what's the learning moment? What's the teachable moment here for us? Well, I think the important thing is to be aware, whether you're a lawyer or a judge, of implicit bias. Right. That you have, everyone has implicit biases that are based somewhat on our experience, but that we apply uh, unconsciously. And so it's helpful to be aware of that just in your ordinary decision making, that you're making presumptions based on either cultural stereotypes or prior experiences, but your data sample isn't big enough. And that's what we do. We often, we've had five bad experiences with people who wear hats, right? So we think everybody with a hat is bad. Right. And that's not, and judges make the same thing in terms of, of you know, bad heuristics. We say it's a caught inside burglary. Well, he must be guilty. We don't even bother to think it through. So a lot of these things don't have to do with characteristics, but have to do with shortcuts we use in thinking that help us, we think, but may not. In some instances, they may be wrong. And they are habits we've gotten into, uh, and particularly where it has to do with judgment uh, of people in cases. It's particularly dangerous, and we are talking about this before, that a judge's implicit bias has potential to do far greater harm sure. um, than our ordinary implicit bias in life if we choose to go to one store right. or another yeah. or yeah. something like yeah. that. Great. Thank you. I would, I would kind of takeaway is listen to your clients you know because a lot of times particularly if you've been practicing for a long time now like I represent lawyers right so I don't look at every client and go well he must have violated he or she must have violated their ethical obligations cannot do that right and, and it can you can get into that kind of rut if you do the same kind of work but you should definitely listen to every client and take their request for relief seriously right so if you have and just using this example if you have a dad for example in family law and he says I'm the primary parent I want to parent I'm nurturing I'm loving I'm doing all these things you do a total disservice to that dad if you say well the court will never give you the kids so we're just not going to pursue this and I think that's one of the things we have to think about in representing our clients the best that we can. We still have to hear them and not put our biases on what they can or cannot do because we're here to help them. So if you have a father, and I'm just using this example, who really has um, the ability to parent and the desire to parent, why tell that father you'll never win? That does a disservice because of, of our biases that we're putting on, on top of that client. Okay, thank you. Uh, hypothetical number four here. Uh, you're an adjunct professor at the local law school and you're teaching a first year criminal law class. In order to make your presentation relevant to the students, you refer, a recent, you refer to a recent case involving a police shooting in the city where the law school is located. And the first question you pose is directed to one of two African American law students in the class and it insinuates that the student has had similar experiences with law enforcement solely. Uh, as you continue your discussion of the case, it becomes evident that the student and several others in the class are uncomfortable about the direction this conversation is taking, and you see that the student uh, you have called upon is visibly shaken and that his eyes have filled with tears. Uh, what should the professor do at the moment he realizes he has done something that has hurt the student? Should he apologize and ask for the student to engage with him in the class about his feeling? Should he lead a discussion regarding uh, uh, microaggression and uncomfortable conversations in the classroom uh, as the case is being presented? Uh, and Or do nothing and continue to teach uh, persons as planned? Uh, otherwise, uh, he should just go home as a bad guy. Uh, all right. Uh, Josie, what do you think? Well, this is what gets us to conscious uh, inclusion. And uh, as a person who is trying to model behavior and, and really be that connection to ultimately the pipeline to the practice of law, you have to do something. And it, and it, and it needs to be useful. It needs to be apologetic. It needs to be sincere. 
this is where we start to realize that um, microaggressions um, are commonplace. And they don't stop at the door to the law school. And I think the best analysis, although you have uh, a series of documents in the resources that will tell you what microaggressions, micro insults, micro invalidations are, the best example that I can give you is very simple. You're trying to enjoy yourself. You're at a picnic. You get a mosquito bite. One can be annoying, but that constant bite of a mosquito, a mosquito bite here, a mosquito bite there, a mosquito bite here, a mosquito bite there, that is analogous to what happens when you are often in isolation in a classroom. Jim talked about stress. The it doesn't stress, have to be race-based, though, right? It doesn't have to be race-based, right. but it is often race-based. It, it, now in law schools, likely 50% of most law school classrooms are dominated by women. But race is still an issue. And to the extent that faculty have a responsibility, we at Loyola feel it's our responsibility to make sure that there is a respectful climate in our workplace, in that classroom. It is absolutely the responsibility of the faculty member to, to take a moment uh, to, to analyze what had happened and try to remediate it in, in real time. And often, faculty need to have the training to do that. You know, uh, uh, our group uh, says that the best going back to the polling, is to uh, apologize and ask the student to engage with him in the class about how he is feeling. I mean, I, actually, I, I thought there was a better option, and that's you can apologize and ask the class to engage in a discussion about how someone could react to that. I, I just it struck me as wrong to call out the student and focus on his or her immediate reaction. It just keeps the singular focus on the student. and. Why, why the student didn't have that coming? To Bob, him? that's what I was getting at. You, yeah. you, you actually have to know what you're doing when you're going to engage in that kind of a conversation uh, because race talk is hard. And, and, and if a faculty member is um, able to do it well, it can be that teachable moment that engages the class to talk about what the climate is in that classroom at that particular moment. But to do nothing is no longer an option. Right. Um, I think. Go ahead. Um, yes. Yes, please. I, I, I know this is not my my question, but um, it is now. I, <laughs> I I have taught at a couple of law schools where I was one of two or one or two black faculty members, and I had students come to me with with issues like this of things they had experienced in the classroom but they did not say anything to the professor. The professor did not apologize, did not start this. And I think part of it is that um, the professor doesn't see that singling out the student and presuming what that student's background is, is a, is a form of bias. Um, it doesn't seem likely that a professor who does that, who does that singling out and does that presuming is then going to suddenly get enlightened and say, my goodness, I shouldn't have done that. Um, I've made some presumptions about you, and I hope that never happens again. Um, it's not likely to happen unless the, unless the professor is called out. And that's where I, my, my point is that that's where bystanders come in. And I think it is, it is good for people like ourselves who are enlightened, who see something like this. You see something, you should say something. So it would, I think it would be incumbent upon the other people in the classroom to maybe question the, the professor or maybe raise the issue. Thank you for that addition. OK, uh, let's change gears a little bit. Uh, next hypothetical, number five. Your law firm participates in a local law school's uh, externship program. Uh, you decide to take your law school extern to a negotiation with a lo local labor union. Your student is introduced and initially made to feel welcome in the room. Several times, though, during the break periods, one of the ma uh, management attorneys makes a, a variety of comments, including racial slurs about the female Latin American attorney for the union. During the lunch break, that attorney asked a law student about her personal background. 
The student informs the group that she is a Southside resident and names the school she's attended. She then adds, by the way, you probably should know I am a Latina, just like the attorney you've been dishing all afternoon. Oh, he said, just said disgusting. I said dishing. Uh, <laughs> at this point, the law student excuses herself and returns to the boardroom where the negotiations resume. So, ha, the question's there. At what point should the attorney supervising the student respond to the comments that were made by the other management attorney? Uh, during the, the first of the several breaks, where all are present or speak to the management attorney, making the offensive comments privately out of only after the law student has left the room. Um, oh, that's an interesting one. Josie? Yeah, believe it or not, it's happened. Um, and not necessarily with a law student, but, but with me, because when people look at me, they presume what I am. I'm, I'm an African-American woman over the age of we won't go into that. So, <laughs> but, but what you have to do is you have to have the conversation when it is happening. And I, and, I, and I refer to what my colleague has said, that's when you need to be an ally. That's when you need to be vulnerable or direct or honest enough to speak up while that conversation is happening. Um, you know, the, the young woman, as we paint the scenario, goes back into um, the boardroom uh, to continue those negotiations. But it would be also incumbent if this were a scenario involving a student and uh, a professional, that that professional be a role model and, and, and speak truth to power. Um, and, it, and it takes heart and it takes soul and it takes uh, an ability to, to really put yourself out there. Uh, but if we think this doesn't happen, and it doesn't happen in law firms or in corporate boardrooms, um, but I'm speaking to the choir now. Well, you are, and I, but although I think an add-on to the answer to my mind was when I read this that, you know, if, if the uh, lawyer who had enough uh, mentorship in him felt uh, it was appropriate to bring the student to the uh, to the event itself then when the management attorney said what was said uh, uh, he should have spoken up about it absolutely and at that time uh, and uh, you know because I mean that's what leadership in the bar is all about isn't it I mean don't put up with it and common sense you know, uh, by the way the uh, our group says that uh, that should be brought up a discussion with the management attorney during the first of several breaks uh, w when everyone is present. You know, even if that creates an embarrassing moment for someone, that's tough. Tough, but then, then keep your mouth shut, you know, and change your way of thinking. I think it doesn't Turn do any good to have the discussion um, in the second, second scenario after the law student has left the room yeah. because part of what your, your job is as a leader and as a mentor is to demonstrate to that student that you you are her ally, and that you are validating her position and the and the the injury that's being inflicted on her. So I think it doesn't do any good to to make the make the comments and corrections after she's left the room. Right. Actually, it's a lost moment. It's, it's just anything. It is. Um, a question. Uh, a question in the back. Okay, we got a question in the back. So. Those of you who are sort of on the forefront training the next generation, are you seeing improvement? Are you seeing the needle being moved? Younger millennials seem to be more empowered to speak directly to this issue. What that in, uh, intern did, I would never have been able to do uh, you know, when I was a student. The idea of standing up in that uh, scenario and saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, you've just put down my people. So are you, um, those of you who are um, seeing law students, are you seeing the needle move on this? I would probably concur with this. I, I, I absolutely do see the, the needle moving, and I see the needle moving in the right direction. But it also makes those of us who are working within the law school setting, we've got to be on our toes to make sure our climate is respectful that, that our climate is welcoming and that the law students know that they are expected. And I think that it's the same truth 
that would apply to uh, a, a minority student or, or a woman or a student who might not be presumed to be able-bodied in uh, the legal workplace. So this is not just about the pipeline, the law schools, but I, I absolutely do see um, the, uh, the students moving in that direction. And we are learning as they are learning as well. It, I've, been, I've been teaching at Loyola for 30 years, and I think students are, do, do have a different standard. Uh, but I think one of the misperceptions about millennials is that they want you to be um, easy on them, right? And, and I think they're, they're accepting of you being tough, but you have to be fair. And what happened here was somebody was being unfair. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we, we have the duty, the last hypothetical, there's nothing wrong with making students uncomfortable. That's a job of a professor. But what happened in the prior hypothetical is that insinuation or targeting was unfair. And that's what really drives millennials uncrazy, and they are very uh, quick to identify that and speak up about it. And I think that's a good thing, uh, because to the degree we uh, of the older generation are unfair, we should be called out. Well, but we of the older generation, I, I think that uh, speaking to a lot of my my colleagues, they don't know where to they don't know where the line is between trying to be fair versus unfair, try to teach. You know, when did the when did people become so fragile and naive? God bless you. Uh, well, and you I, know, I don't think it's, it's about it's people not, becoming fragile. Uh, I think it's about that we're we're facing a different workforce. People are included in the workforce that weren't included. So our conversations have to change and our modes of dealing with people. But really, this isn't. People think this is a new concern. Um, anybody have a coin in their pocket? Anybody? All right. Are you handing them out? No, I'm not. <laughs> but, but written on all of our coins, right? E pluribus unum. Uh, any of you know when that started getting put on our coins and what it means? So 1794 is when we started putting on the coins. And that means out of many, one. So diversity has been an inclusion, has been at the heart of being an American since the beginning. You know how many closing arguments mm. that's going to end up in? Well, it's been the target. It's a whole offline conversation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, uh, All right, moving on. Hypothetical number six here. Okay. Uh, Karen, counsel for the defense, and Todd, counsel for the plaintiffs, are opposing counsel in a contentious employment discrimination lawsuit. During Karen's deposition of one of the plaintiffs, Todd keeps interrupting her. Karen, who had become increasingly annoyed, asked Todd to stop interrupting her, and Todd responded by saying, don't raise your voice to me. It's not becoming of a woman or an attorney who is acting professionally under the rules of professional responsibility. Okay. Question. Should Karen respond to Todd's comments? Yes or no? Uh, well, it's kind of an interesting one. I want to hear what uh, Allison has to say about that. About this typo is it's real. Very. Um, Absolutely. I know a lot of people looked at it and said, "Well, someone was very creative," but it, it's it's a real case. I think it's in your materials. Um, one of the things that um, this kind of st statement highlights is that there is different standards or expectations of how women should act and how men should act. And it kind of loops back to the earlier questions we had where a woman would be seen negatively aggressive or a man would seem positively tenacious. So for this type of thing, and, and what happens in a lot of these cases is there's frustration. You know, a lot of times the lawyer is frustrated and the opponent is a woman lawyer and the frustration is a personal attack. Okay, and a lot of times, um, if you want to talk about, you mentioned the line, you shouldn't have to personally attack the other side. That's the line, period, right? It, it's not really that difficult um, to, to make a comment about someone else's behavior. Um, you know, it's not becoming, right? That's a real throwback to, I don't know, an era way before I was born. What is becoming, okay? But it's okay if it's a male lawyer that is acting that way. And so if you look at, I think it's in your programs, um, I don't want to paraphrase it because it's written very it's eloquently. It's Claypool versus Donnelly Monterey. Right, Claypool, right. And so it's, a, it's basically this, this court, this is Northern District of California, really kind of nails it. You know, this is a sexist remark 
this is a male-dominated um, profession with a male-dominated attitudes of how women should, should conduct themselves. And, and I will tell you that a lot of the, um, the sexist comments that come are usually from men to women that, that feel the women are winning, the women are successful. Um, and so the frustration comes and the desperation of wanting to attack personally. And so that's why I, I, I hope that if you don't take any other takeaway from this one, it, the, the line is you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to attack personally to be a successful advocate. You can advocate aggressively for your client, you can be tenacious, but you don't have to attack the other side and you could probably still win. Have you heard about the uh, crying motions? Motions in limine? The crying motions? Yeah. I have not. So I have a lawyer friend in Texas, and she's been telling me that uh, she's been, she tries a lot of cases, and she keeps getting hit with these motions in limine to prevent her from crying in front of the jury. Wow. And uh, so what she's done is, is she's uh, uh, threatened to uh, publish the motions in, in the local paper. Uh, every time she gets one, and they and they uh, and they put, withdraw the motion. But I mean, it's that kind of thing. That uh, what would you do with a crying motion, Judge? I mean, every time I try a case against Allison, she cries. She, she gets in front of the jury. And the jury loves it for her. They love it. <laughs> love it when she cries. Anyone here know uh, Harleen Mattis, by chance, a local lawyer in town? She used to try, and she was she she was with child, and she tried cases. And, and the lawyers against her would go nuts because they'd say, oh, she, she, she only tries big cases when she's having a new baby. And then <laughs> she wins them all. How about the fact she's a pretty good lawyer, you know? <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. uh, so, Judge, I think we know what you'd do about this motion. Well, yeah, and, and I would point out that the manifestation of uh, bias based on gender is a violation of the rules of professional conduct as well, 8.4. Uh, D, uh, comment three. So if you manifest bias based on uh, gender, that is a violation of the rules. Uh, would, we, uh, would we turn them into the ARDC, Josie? Well, I think that has happened on occasion that, sure, that sure judges has. have um, read um, deposition transcripts yep. and have um, indicated to the ARDC that they should look into this. But I think back to the early 80s when I was, um, well, uh, the middle 80s when I was practicing, um, and these kinds of issues happened in depositions with people mm -hmm. speaking over you. Um, you know, it was, it was old school then to certify the question, put it on the record. Uh, often I would be in a courtroom uh, at the Daly Center where, um, and it would be um, uh, a, a male attorney on either side of the case. Uh, with a, a female judge, and that would happen often. So it, it pains me that this case is 2016 mm -hmm. and we're still having the conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, opposing counsel number two. So here we have Courtney, counsel for the defense, and Jason, plaintiff's counsel. They're opposing one another in a commercial case in federal court. And in speaking with Courtney in the hallway outside of the case, uh, Jason calls her... C at pound exclamation mark N E Y using a vulgar term. Oh, okay. He uses the term again when addressing her in an email that reads, Your days of filing unnecessary frivolous motions will come to an end. So, should Courtney alert the court to Jason's comments? Um, yes or no? So, he said a really bad thing in an email, which is really stupid. Okay. Allison, what do you think about that? Yes, it is. This and, is right out of the case. Right, and this is Northern District of Illinois 2017. So this is really recent, right? And I know people are going, how is this possible? It's called Know Your Forum, and that is not the forum. You to certainly do this. don't want to do right. You certainly don't want to do this in federal court, right? Okay, so this is, you know, rude and vulgar, and, and, and part of it, again, is the frustration because the other lawyer is, is winning, right? She's succeeding on whatever motion she's doing. She's advancing her case, and, and he's not able to keep up with her. Um, what is interesting is, and stupid, is you would put this in writing. 
right? So not only did he say it to her, he put it in an email um, and made it like in case she missed it. He wanted to make sure she didn't miss it, right? So it's, 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 it's vulgar, it's terrible. Um, one, one of the things that the other take, the teaching and take away from this is that I don't remember um, the exact firm she was at, but she did talk to her managing, uh, her managing partner. And the managing partner is the one who brought it to the judge's attention. And that is really a beautiful way to address it because in some situations this happens and there's no accountability. It doesn't ever see the light of day. No one ever knows that this happened. So the managing attorney is responsible for basically bringing it to the court. The federal court looks at it. They suspend him from practicing in federal court for a year. Okay, and there is also, and it's in your materials, there is an ARDC case as well, which I'm not sure if it's resolved, um, but certainly if he's uh, suspended from the federal court, he's going to get a suspension from the ARDC as well. Um, one of the things that, um, like I said, is really important is that don't think these things don't happen. Right. This is this is 2017. These things happen, and a lot of times lawyers don't know what to do. They don't know who to say, who to tell. So if you're in a, if you're in a firm that doesn't have any type of policy, this is a good idea to think about what can we do to assist the lawyers in our firm if these types of things happen to them. Because certainly this person should be held account accountable, right? This is vulgar. This is is definitely designed to intimidate. There is no other rational reason to do this except to intimidate her. Well, it's even, it's, it's not only that, I think it's more. I mean, because we talk about this a bit in our office because we've had situations. And it not only is it an, an effort to intimidate, it also impacts the, the outcome of the case. Sure. You know, when, because if I can get you to be intimidated and you don't do anything about it, it's going to give me a litigation advantage for the wrong reasons. And that's not proper either. That's compromising the client's rights. Uh, and I think uh, our group, our audience, of course, resoundingly agrees with bringing this to the court attention, the court's attention. And, and uh, kudos to the firm and credit to the firm for having done so. Uh, Judge, anything to add? Well, it, it, the uh, Executive Committee's decision refers to 8.4G, that's in the Northern District Rules. In Illinois, it's 8.4D, Comment 3, uh, because uh, Illinois has not adopted 8.4G uh, of the ABA rules, but it's uh, the equivalent provision. The tie-in there is exactly, though, Bob, would you rec or recognize there as the determinative? Illinois, this constitutes a violation when it's uh, when such actions are prejudicial to the administration of justice. So this is case affecting, uh, and it definitely violates the rules of professional conduct. Uh, a lot of times these kind of things happen during uh, court proceedings where uh, where is not this kind of wording, but harsh words among each other, either in emails or outside of court, and they want judges to resolve them. Um, we're not the disciplinary authority. We don't have the role to adjudicate discipline on attorneys. Um, and so often, uh, you know, we want to admonish lawyers not to continue the conduct, but the real, um, the only body uh, that has the authority to regulate lawyers is the Illinois Supreme Court, and the only way to police that is through reporting to the ARDC. So if you're, you're really going to affect the lawyer's conduct here, that's the proper body, but we just adjudicate cases, we don't discipline lawyers. And, and I just want to, if I could add one other point with the, the 8.4G, because I was on the um, ABA Professional Responsibility Committee that presented that rule to the House of Delegates, and it was approved. Um, one of the pushbacks um, for Illinois and in lots of other states, they had objections, but one of it was, what about free speech? You know, don't we have a right to say what we say? And the answer is, this is what we're talking about, right? This is not protected speech. There is no right to say this. And this is the kind of behavior that was at the core of that kind of rule, because apparently and sadly, lawyers don't get along with other lawyers. 
That's why we have the Commission on Professionalism. And if you haven't seen um, the work of that profession, Commission on Professionalism, you should look it up. It's to civility.org. It has <coughs> wonderful programs and wonderful information. But I just want to make the point that this is the kind of behavior and conduct that we don't want in the profession. Same thing with the, the student who's Latina. She's the future. Right? She's a student. She's walking into a meeting with a managing attorney and she's immediately insulted. What does that tell her about what this profession is like? Okay? And so we all have a duty to really be careful how we treat each other because this is completely unnecessary. To, for this to happen so close in time should really be a wake up call for anyone who thought that this doesn't happen. It absolutely does. We have some questions and an awful lot of comments coming in more from the uh, thousands on the internet. But uh, regarding some of these issues, uh, someone is asking if the uh, people involved here have substance abuse problems, how does that uh, work in tandem with the first half of the program about what you're commenting on? Well, I, I, I could jump in there as a former ARDC counsel. I mean, when, when we saw cases with really egregious conduct, sometimes there is an abuse problem. Sometimes there's an anger management. Sometimes there's an alcohol problem, but not all the time. Well, I, but I think that uh, at least okay. from uh, my, my observation, uh, and my, uh, let's get my own mic. My observation, you know, within the last 12 months, we've I've seen a, a lot of depth in a couple of particular cases that are extraordinarily contentious and these lawyers are going at it and it's so improper and and the the question is well what do you do about it and and I think it's there's nothing wrong at some juncture uh, to say hey uh, your your conduct is way out of line this deposition is being paused and get up and take your client and leave Take your chances with the court. You explain what happened, uh, whether it's make a motion for a protective order, make a motion for, uh, for supervision of a deposition. Uh, all of those things can happen. Uh, no young lawyer, man or woman, should be intimidated and in a uh, you know a judicial proceeding. It's just not right. And there yeah, are just remedies. Just a little side note: I conducted had two depositions conducted in front of me yeah. because of problems. Yeah. So I'm going to do it where I can see yeah. what's, uh, what's going on. Miles Beerman? Unfortunately, a lot of this goes on <clears throat> in a courtroom in uh, family law cases. And what happens is the judge sits there and does nothing. Listen. And what, you get. What's up with it? Pardon? Puts up with it. Puts up with it. And people are not only interrupting their, the other lawyer, they're interrupting the judge. And the judge sits and does nothing. Now, way back in the old days, <laughs> they we contempt, won't say how many old days ago well, that was. I've been there a long time, and contempt would have been issued. Right. And that's and that is something that a judge can do: issue a contempt. You can't do what the ARDC would do, but you can certainly control your courtroom. And if you hold a guy in contempt enough times, or a woman in contempt, maybe it'll stop. But it 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 cannot go on in a courtroom without the judge taking charge. Well, I want to tell you what I say to lawyers when they start interrupting each other. Um, if I could hear two people talk at once, they would send me to domestic relations. Oh. <laughs> but it's true. Oh. It, it happens to be oh. true. All right. And, and the lawyers note, laugh. <laughs> on that note, hypothetical number eight here, our last typo of the afternoon. Uh, a number of lawyers at a large firm are brainstorming regarding a new client. One of the lawyers, Julie, responds with an idea that is met with lukewarm feedback. Sitting next to Julie is a new lawyer, Jim, who is at his first meeting with the group. He chimes in with the identical idea, and the group enthusiastically <laughs> embraces it and congratulates him for his creativity. Julie is about to point out to the group that she just said the same thing, but the meeting takes another turn. What should Julie do about it? Should she... Please enter the, the following MCLE verification code, 5281. This is, uh, there's another opportunity, uh, an appropriate time to, at the meeting to expound on her idea. Should she raise the issue later with her superiors at the round table? So to tell the group how she felt and how slighted she was, 
or let it go and wait for the next time so she can build her case. Wow, that's not a good one. Cunyon, what do you think about that? Um, the first thing I think about it is that it happens so frequently that there's a term for it, and it's called mansplaining. Um, and it is as if the a man has to interpret what the woman quietly whispered in her um, unconfident voice, and then can reiterate the exact same thing, maybe with a, with a few more decibels and a little more, little more timbre, and, and actually be responded to. It is a, I don't, I, I bet many of the women in this, in this classroom right now um, have had this happen to them, and I certainly have had it happen to me. One thing you can try is to use humor to diffuse the situation. You might say, oh, I'm sorry, I must have been speaking in another language. Um, or you like say, <laughs> or you can, you can wait until after the, the um, repeater has made his point and then expound on it to make sure that they know that it was your point in the first place. Okay, uh, Allison, how about you? anything to add I mean it, it, it does happen um, I think humor is one way you know a lot of it is I just feel that the onus should not be on the person you know it, it would be great to, to take your point from before someone else in the room should be able to speak up and say didn't Julie just say that you know I mean because when these things happen it always seems to be on the person to to do the confrontation to bring it up mm -hmm. to wave a flag and say you've said something inappropriate and I just think to the, the points that were made earlier by Cunyon and Josie you know we all need to be doing this collectively it shouldn't just be on the one person to have that responsibility because we're all seeing it right it's not like we don't see it we all see it and I think we should all really try to support each other sure. All right, I, got, I do have one more though before Leslie. Uh, I want to try to get this in because I mistakenly missed it. Uh, it's on trial tactics. The law there are lawyers representing a family in a wrongful death case that could involve large amount of damages. The decedent is African American and the defendant is a Fortune 500 company. The case comes to trial and the parties draw a judge who is also Af African American. When voir dire begins, an African-American attorney for the first time enters an appearance for the defendant. Is the defendant engaging in appropriate and smart trial strategy or inappropriate and offensive stereotyping? And for those of you who don't know, don't deny it, this does happen all the time. Uh, Judge, what's your take on that? It's both offensive and ineffective. Um, so people are smart enough, juries and judges, that they know they're trying to, somebody's trying to manipulate them. And if you have somebody at counsel table who says nothing, does nothing, mm -hmm. but is of the same race of the uh, opposite party, uh, they know what you're trying to do, and, and it doesn't work. So the, the real problem here is that they haven't had a diversity of their legal staff to begin with, so that they have competent lawyers of all races and genders and orientations to represent people on cases, and that wasn't, uh, yeah. you know, that's, that's what they're doing here is just tokenism. Yeah, our group says it's inappropriate and offensive stereotyping. What, what do you do, though, when they bring in now a former judge? You know, so <laughs> former judge uh, Lacalo, I'm making that up, Danny Lacalo shows up or some other shows up. Well, you up. know he won't be effective in trial, <laughs> now, so you now, should now say now you, now you, you won I the case. I didn't say that, so Judge Lacalo, if you're on this program, you know, well, here, I make a motion to eliminate to make sure that we do not refer to Judge Locallo as Judge Locallo in the front of the jury. There's one judge in this courtroom, and it's Judge Donahue, and, or whatever. All right. Um, Leslie, you had a, a question. You were, you were next. I, these, are, these, are two, these two hours are on separate topics. Right. But they're very, very related. I'm sitting here listening, and... And as I'm hearing about how women are still called vile names and are treated differently in terms of interrupting and are not given credit for ideas, it makes me sick to my stomach and it affects my situation about burnout. And, and, and the two are very related because when you, when you live with that year in and year out, it just it gets to you. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, anyone else in the room? Or, uh, we have a, do we have a question on the... We have loads of questions from the uh, audience, but the discussion was flowing, and I didn't want to interrupt too much. Yeah, and I, well, I just want to piggyback on that. I think, okay. you know, Cunyon was raising the point that, that we, we still have not lived up to the promise of what America should be. 
as the poet said, America has not been America to me. Uh, but I think at our founding, we had, we have engraved upon it that everybody should be treated with dignity and respect. And we're still trying to fulfill that promise. And the fact that we don't uh, is hurtful to people and injures people. And so this isn't something that is, I think, you know, about people being fragile. It's about us all being fair and respectful uh, of the people we live with. Well, Pam, we have time for one question. I have one co one comment. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Please. One of the one of the things that um, offenders say in defense of their behavior is that I'm just preparing them for the real world. Um, when they when they mm. they single out that student and make that student uncomfortable, they say, "Well, that's what the world is like. It's not me. I'm just preparing them because that's what I'm here man up. to do." Man up there. Uh, man, man, man and up. Say, yeah, woman you're, up. You're you're being too fragile. Um, you know, suck it up and and be effective for your clients. And um, I think that's an excuse, and it's a people or excuse. Um, but it is, it's one that's often heard. Well, very quickly, because we're really out of time, but in piggybacking on what Cunyon just said, uh, what can, can lawyers do to ensure that their firms are in tune with inclusion in preparing the workforce of the future? Uh, what kind of retention strategy should they be putting in place now? Uh, okay, can I just go ahead, say Josie. something? There, there is um, a diversity consultant uh, that is now working for Netflix. Her name is Verna Myers, and she describes diversity and inclusion as follows. Diversity is being invited to the dance. Inclusion is being asked to dance. So, I mean, you know, we talk a good talk, but, but you have to have an action plan and you have to roll it out. But I didn't catch your name, but I want to, I and this is not related necessarily to the question, but this is a quote from Maya Angelou. Um, unintentional digs does the greatest harm to people of color and to women. So to your point, I think that's the connection between both panels today. And then on that note, I want to apologize to anyone who didn't get their yeah. question asked. And uh, left to right, people are asking to fill out their surveys. If you can't see the names, it's left to right, Judge Tom Donnelly, Allison Wood, Cunyon Gordon, and Josie Goff. And, for, and we thank them all. Ladies yes. and gentlemen, thank you. See you next year. Thank you for attending today's program, The Path to Wellness and Conscious Inclusion. Please be sure to fill out and submit the evaluation form that you found by clicking on the handouts print capability tab. Certificates of attendance will be emailed to you within the next 10 days.